Well, let me start off with this. You know, sometimes when you speak or you preach, you really are preaching to yourself, and you need to. And tonight, actually, to be honest with you, I want to just encourage myself a little bit, and uh, I hope I encourage you. So my lead-in is this. We read an article a while back that says sometimes the decade of your 50s is the hardest decade of your life. And the reason is twofold. One, all your kids are flying the coop. They're leaving, getting married, and at the same time, the generation above you is passing away. And that's really happened for us. All four parents had cancer. My dad had it twice. All four parents passed away from cancer. Pam had cancer. I just put to rest about three weeks ago a nephew of mine in the U.S. who passed away at 32. And his mom, my only sibling, just emailed us a day ago and said she needs to get a biopsy because she's afraid she has lung cancer. On top of that, the kids flew the coop all around the world. David lived over here in Tauranga for seven years. He's now married back in the States. Sarah's now over here. Rebecca's over in Sydney. So. I'm happy for all the family things that happened in the decade of the 50s in our immediate family, and it's been quite a ride. And so yesterday was my birthday, my birthday, and I was 59. I know I don't look a day over 58, but I'm looking to 60, and the number 60 feels old, but I'm also telling you I'm happy to be done with my 50s with everything that's happened, and we've tried to do it in honor and respect and to serve but it's been a real ride. And then on top of that, we sold everything we owned a year and a half ago and we moved to New Zealand. So if you started by asking me, Kurt, what's your vision? <laughs> I would tell you, I have no idea. All I know is I'm supposed to be here in this location and that's what I know. And that leads me to, uh, I ran into two scriptures. Hebrews 8.10 uh, says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And that's the first thing that struck me as, you know, God said, basically, he took his finger and wrote in a bunch of stone Ten Commandments, and he changed that to say, I want to write it here. And that's actually what's got me thinking right now is, okay, God, I'm in New Zealand, and I think that's where you want me to be, and that's all I know. So I'm asking him the question, what are you writing on my heart? It's the original tattoo, by the way, <laughs> to think of it that way. So I want to ask the same question, what is God writing on your heart? Let's learn together. But that's so, so important. It has to get personal. It has to get real. At the same time, well, let me say it this way, too. I wrote down four statements. The price that Christ paid on the cross is the same love for everyone. But God takes that same love for everyone, and he loves us each uniquely. We are each unique. God has vision for each one of us. So he uniquely writes on each one of our hearts. I then ran into, I don't know how you say it over here, everything I say in the U.S., you don't say it. It's, mod, it, it's Matata, you know, over in the U.S., but no, it's Matata over here. I mean, I keep getting everything wrong. So do you say Habakkuk or Habakkuk, or how do you say it? Habakkuk, okay. So Habakkuk 2, this vision thing, it struck me with this same scripture. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. So that was talking about tablets again and writing on the heart in vision. So like I'm, right now all I can tell you is the Lord wants to begin to speak to me. And as I look to 60... He's got things for me to do and to become and to be and to walk out with him. So I want to encourage you the same is true for you. The first part of that says I'm going to stand my watch, set myself up on the rampart. I'm going to watch and see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I'm corrected. It's like a, a, a movie with a, a big castle, you know, and they climb up on the wall and they're looking and they're at, is the enemy coming? And they're up really high so they can see. And the enemy comes and they've got some kind of thing. They blow the horns. You know, or they bang. You know, they light a fire, something happens, the enemy's coming, the enemy's coming. But that means they're watchful and they're waiting. So that's the thing I want to encourage us all. Like, how much are you anticipating that God actually could look at you out of all the people in the universe and have a word for you, have a vision for your heart, something he uniquely wants to say? But then it also says, I'm going to see what my response is. It made me think of this. Anybody ever watch American football, gridiron football? God has a way when you think the play is supposed to go one way that he decides to go different. So the quarterback walks up, you know, like, blue, 32, 
blew 32, and all of a sudden the defense shuffles, and you go, oh, my God, that play's not going to work. And so they start doing some quirky stuff. Check, check, check. Rascal three, rascal three, Omaha. And they start making signals, and, and they do all this kind of stuff, you know. And then, Watch the blitz, watch the blitz. Watch that woman. She'll steal your heart. She'll steal your heart. You know, and they make all kinds of calls. I like to be a little silly. You know, and then it's set, hut, hut. But that's the thing with God. When you think it's going to go one way, he knows the way he's uniquely made you and how it needs to go. And he's going to wait to see how you react. And part of how you learn to react is how he can write the vision on your heart. The other thing is it says you have to write the vision and make it plain so somebody could run and read it. It's like the old town crier from 200 years ago, you know, where they stood on the corner, hear ye, hear ye, next Wednesday there's a town hall meeting and Rena will share her political views or whatever. I'm not going to that meeting. And, uh, you know, and so it has to be very plain, but it has to be plain to you. The vision he writes on your heart has to be actionable. Um, Hosea 4, 6 says, my people perish for lack of knowledge or lack of vision. It means they cast off restraint when they don't have the wisdom and the knowledge they need, when they can't see what's going on, then they scatter and they start to do their own thing. And what matters is how many friends you have on Facebook, not what God's doing in your life, for example. So um, let me say it this way. What is God's vision for you? What does he want to write on the tablet of your heart? What will you do to get the answer and how will you respond? What risk and faith will you take to become this and accomplish the vision? Do you actually believe it will come? Do you believe God can accomplish it through you, and can you become it? You know, so he said, make it plain, P-L-A-I-N. It's a little play on words, but make it plain so it can make it plain, P-L-A-N-E, like an airplane. You've got to do something to get up enough speed, to get enough draft underneath the wings to get the takeoff and to go. So you've got to get some speed. You've got to get some wind of the Holy Spirit. You've got to make the thing get up in the air. And it's when you get up in the air, then you can see what's going on. So when you make it plain, you have to make it plain. The other thing is this. In one of the Lord of the Rings movies, Gandalf, I think they're getting ready to fight the orcs. And one day he just says, there's only one thing that matters. How will this day end? And every day we have to learn to walk out whatever we understand God's purpose is in our life and what he wants us to do. You know, Jesus said, sufficient for today is the stress of the day. It's smart to plan. You can learn from the past, but we got to live now. And so my question will be, how will this day end? So maybe as we go to look at vision, to figure out how this day will end, to make it get some takeoff, the best way to look forward is to actually look backwards. Now, what I mean is this. It's not like you're driving forward and you're looking in the side view mirror because the side view mirror says objects in the mirror may appear larger or closer than they really are. We don't want to do that because that's what happened um, with the giants. They looked at the giants and went, oh, my God, they're so big. They went to spy out the land and went, oh, my God, this will never happen, except for a little boy named David who had five smooth stones who said, you know, actually the giant's not quite so big. He's about the same thing as a bear and a lion and I can take him down. But they let a backwards view of who they thought they were make things much larger than it appeared when it really wasn't. So I'm not talking about doing that, but I am talking about this. The Lord told Israel from time to time, stop and build some stones, build some remembrance stones. Remember where you came along the path and how I helped you because when you get to a tough time, you're gonna look back at those stones and go, yep, God came through back then. And yep, God came through back then. And so when I'm up against a tough time and my giants aren't behind me, it's not Pharaoh's chariots chasing me anymore. I'm now facing new giants in the promised land. I remember what happened to those giants back in the Red Sea, and I'm encouraged, and I know I can take the land. So what I want to get into here for just a few minutes is a few uh, points on if you're looking backwards, you can ask yourself two questions. How do I handle wilderness? Let's just look at some examples in the Bible. And then I'm going to look at what I'll call major questions. From time to time, God has a question that's just an iconic question that shapes the person in the Bible. So let me look at those two things. Are you with me so far? Okay, making sense? So number one about wilderness, it is the process of the Holy Spirit to lead you into wilderness. 
we know Jesus went into wilderness and they led the children of Israel into wilderness. So if you are looking for a good time with God, chances are, while you might have some of that because he is a good God, you're going to find wilderness. So if you don't get comfortable with wilderness, if you don't get comfortable, like in the book of Acts, if you don't get comfortable with supernatural, you'll have a hard time allowing God to write his vision on your heart because he's a wilderness God, he's a supernatural God, but at the end of the day, the tomb is empty, the jail doors are open. Okay, Numbers 14 and 16, this is the classic wilderness example, but if you just look at those three chapters in there, you find that somehow the children of Israel, they've got Charlton Heston leading them through the Red Sea. That's a, did he, he was the movie, he, he's the actor, didn't you see that movie? He was Moses and nobody saw that over here. It's not gonna work, sorry. Make it plain. But they get halfway across and all of a sudden they start reasoning out, you know what, this is really tough. And I'm not really keen on this manna thing. And you know what? Actually, even though it was actually slavery back there, we got three square meals a day because they knew they had to feed us so that we could do back-breaking work and make bricks without straw. Actually, Moses, I could trade that out and I could go back there. How insane that was, but there were a lot of them ready to sign up for that. And then there was a guy, Korah, and a few others that came along that said, actually, Moses and Aaron and Miriam, actually, we don't think you're the leaders. Grumble, 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 grumble. So Moses said, let's have an earthquake party. We're going to stand on this earthquake line, and you're going to stand on this earthquake line, and we'll see who's standing when it's all said and done. So the very first watch out for wilderness is, are you going to grumble? I learned a new Kiwi word here, but when your kids are fussy, they're grizzly. Okay, are you going to grizzle over everything? Even Moses, the poor guy, he's got a million people. He's leading them across the desert. He's doing everything he can, but he has one issue. Even though he's the friend of God, he's really getting frustrated. And there's one point in time when they need water, and God says, strike the rock. He strikes the rock, and the water comes out. Later on, they need water again, but uh, this time God says, Moses, just speak to the rock. Maybe it was a form of learning about faith or learning his authority that it wasn't in a thing it was in himself maybe you know maybe maybe not but he is so mad at the people he starts going you bunch of idiot people you just don't get it and the water comes out of the rock and God pulls Moses aside and says listen Moses I get mad at these people too just in everyday vernacular some days I'm frustrated as hell with them but what you don't understand, Moses, is I still love them. And what you did is you misrepresented me to them. And you made them think I'm angry at them when I'm actually not. Because actually I'm going to give my son about a thousand years from now that you don't understand to buy all these people's freedom back. So Moses, I can't let you go into the promised land. That seems really, really hard as a lesson. But it depends on what God's writing on your heart and his vision for you and for what Moses was doing. That lesson needed to be learned. So don't grumble. Don't challenge leadership. Don't let your anger get the best of you. I have the hardest time with that. My job at work is to work on the best process flow we can find. I have this fancy term, value stream manager. All that means is working on continuous improvement across the, what we call the disciplines in the system, like the planning people, the salespeople, the manufacturing people, the systems where they all interchange and work together. That's where the company makes money when you best optimize that. So my job is all day long to find things that don't work right. And I know for me, I have trouble with my anger. I'm always getting mad at why did this happen? And who put that there? And why did this go there? And we said we wouldn't do that. We said we would do this over here. And I find my anger getting the best of me. So this even meant a lot to me for whatever God's writing on my heart. I can't let that happen. Luke 2.19. Mary hid these things in her heart. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Can you imagine what it was like to be Mary? She's probably 15 or something like that. God, I haven't even been to prom this year yet. I've almost got my Facebook friends up to 500. Mary, you get to be the woman of the, I mean, the, the, excuse me, the mother of the Savior of the world. I thought about this. Pam, come up here real quick. I didn't tell you I was going to do this, but like, what would that feel like? 
how much like inspection on your life? Take your glasses off real quick. Crazy as this is, okay? It would be like this, eye to eye. It would be like I'm God and she's Mary, and you would say, Mary, this job is so important that for the rest of your life, I need to look really deep into your heart and give you many secrets about this little boy that you're going to have. And I just need you to do it and hide all this in your heart and make sure he becomes the son of man. Can you do that? Mm -hmm. That's where you say, okay. 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 You know, that's a silly representation, but what if you had to live life that way for the next, I don't know, 50 years or something like that? Somehow Mary had the strength of heart to hide these things in her heart. Joshua 14 is the story of Caleb at 40 years old. He's one of the two spies that says, we can do it. The other 10 says, no, we can't. They take a vote. The 10 win. He said, you know the word, God, that you gave me. Everybody else's heart melted. Nevertheless, I wholly followed you. Now he's 85. They've taken the land. At 40, he went, man, look at that mountain at Hebron. That's a pretty cool place. You know, if we could get over here, I'd take that for my property. It's 45 years later, but God wrote that on his heart. Now they're in. And what does he say? God, I stayed holy with you. I stayed holy, H-O-L-Y, with you. And I also stayed holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. Now give me that mountain because you wrote that vision on my heart. How many of us can stay with something for 45 years or like Noah for 100 years or however long? There's so many great statements of faith that happen years and years and years later. And then he even says this, I'm as strong as 85 as I was at 40. There's still an enemy in here. I'm going to seek the Lord, but perhaps he will drive them out, and then the land will be at peace. And guess what? The land is at peace because of that promise that he remembers. Joshua 6, the walls of Jericho, it says they were securely shut up, but the Lord said, I have given them to you. So what did he tell them? Once each day for six days, I'm going to wind the cord up. Don't say a word. Seventh day, seven times around. On the seventh time, what were they supposed to do? Shout. So the question is, can you shout when you least want to shout? For example, in this room, if we were going to decide we were those people around the walls of Jericho. Oh, did he run off? Oh, no, he didn't. Okay, cool. You'll, you'll understand that in a second. We could probably pick a couple of people in the room to be the leaders of the shout because they've got huge voices. Like, I don't know your name, but you've got a really wonderful voice that really carries in the room or the husband and wife team. Like, they've got really good voices. And we were probably going, yeah, let them shout. We're happy to let them shout. God has this way of changing the defense and watching the audible and saying, actually, no, the people that I'm going to choose to shout probably are about the quietest people in the room because they need to test themselves to know that they can lead and they can shout. So we're going to practice that. So I think probably the two quietest people in the room are Ikuna and Graham. So would you come forward real quick? I picked on Ikuna last time, too. He was my son. He was John the Baptist, and I was his son, Zechariah. And I said back then, you remember, you can, see, you can tell we're related, right? Good looking. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so one of you on that side, and one of you on this side. Okay, now you just have to play along. 30 seconds, just have some fun here. So we're going to start chanting, walls fall down. They're going to lead, okay? So when they start going, walls fall down, you follow. But you can't just go... Walls fall down, walls fall down. I mean, we gotta, we got to decide the walls are coming down, okay? So here we go on three. I'll get you started. Here we go. You follow him, you follow him. Here we go on three. One, two, three. Walls fall down, 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 walls fall down. Do the way. Walls fall down. You were getting into it, weren't you? <laughs> the new hit single by Akuna, Walls Fall Down. Okay, give them a hand clap, all right?
I'm being silly, but here's the deal. Do you have a shout in you? When you've been through your 50s and everybody's dying and it's a mess, do you still have a shout in you? 1 Samuel 22, army of 400 men for David. They're 3D men, in debt, distressed, discontented. I won't take a show of hands, but probably if we put those three words, all of us could probably sign up for one of them. In debt, discontented with my marriage. No, no, wait a minute, no, no, discontented or distressed. You're discontented with my marriage too? Oh, no, no. But the prophet Gad came to David, and David was in this gnarly, rocky place where he could hide and nobody was willing to try and climb up the side. He said, you can't stay here. And oh, by the way, whether you get it or not, the army you need to take the promised land and to create Jerusalem and Zion, it's these 400 distressed and in debt and discontented guys. Good luck. <laughs> but that's not what's on David's heart. Ultimately, what's on his heart is I want to build God a temple. Now, he wasn't allowed to because of all the war he did and all the blood in his hands, as the Bible says. But for him, it was like, fine, I'll start with whoever I've got, and we're going to turn these guys into a great army. And there's 30 or 33 of them are like, you know, the Hall of Fame warrior guys because of something that's on his heart. So it doesn't matter where you start. If you want to sign up for distressed and in debt and discontented, it doesn't matter. God can fix that. He can change you. He can ride on your heart. Joseph in the dungeon. The brothers are all going, oh my God, you know, coat of many colors and we threw you in the pit. And here's his final say. It's all good. God sent me here for just a time as this. So I'm good. All forgiven. Let's be brothers. Let's move on. It creates the nation of Israel out of that action. Okay, some questions real quick. I'm trying to watch my time here a little bit. Genesis 3.1, Satan is talking to Eve. Eve, did God say that you're really going to be like him and that this tree is really, you know, bad stuff? I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean really, Eve. Re I mean, just, just get real. Did God really say that? Eve made two mistakes. One, she could have just went to Adam and said, regardless of you're the authority figure and I came out of you and all the things we could preach from that standpoint, she could have just said, you've been here longer than me. What do you think? <laughs> but she didn't. But here's the deal. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let me call that the tree of reason. There's nothing wrong with reason and intellect. Like if I'm an astronaut and I'm going to the moon, I want a smart guy designing that spaceship. It's not about that, but when it comes to matters of faith and matters of the heart, God's interested in unction. He's interested in hearing his voice. And it has to change from the tree of reason, which I said last time, if you remember, you run tree and reason together, it becomes treason, which is what Satan committed. It has to change from did God say to, I'll tell you what God said. God did say. Blah, 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 blah. This is a promise for my life, and I'm a saved man, and I'm his ambassador on the earth, and I'm here to tell the world that he doesn't count their sins against him, and I'm saved and healed and delivered, and whatever else I could get wound up about. That's what God said. That has to happen in your life. You need to be reading his word and praying, and as he works in your heart, it has to change from did God say to God did say. Nehemiah 4.2, this is another name that I don't know, look, looks like Sanballat or Sanballat or something. There's a Sanballat and Tobiah, and they're against Nehemiah rebuilding the walls around the temple. And they're standing there looking, and the stones are a big pile of nothing. They're all charred and burned, and they're going like, I cannot believe this guy thinks he can rebuild the temple. And they look at the stones and they go, can these burned stones live? But that question is actually about you and me. If we've been through a place in life and we feel a bit burned, burned out, distressed, discontented, in debt, whatever the right word is, the question for life is, can I still live? Can I still, regardless of chart or not, find my place on the wall, 
be part of God's kingdom, support who I need to, relate to the stones next to me. I'll tell you what God did say. God said the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me and it'll quicken my mortal body so you can look at me as a burned stone, but I tell you that same spirit raised me from the dead. God did say that. Ezekiel 37, 3, we know about that. You know, Ezekiel, can these bones come to life? Now, Ezekiel is smart enough to say, Lord, you're going to have to say so first. You're going to have to write something on my heart. But as soon as you do, I'm on the rampart, and I have to see how I'll answer. So Ezekiel decides they're going to live. So the scripture says, as I began to prophesy to the bones, I heard a rattle. We're going to talk about in just a minute the sound of the abundance of rain when it's not raining. You've got to know when God's tugging on your heartstring. You've got to know that you can say, bones, God did say, you will live. And it becomes flesh and muscle and sinew. It becomes structure and relationship, and it works together, and it becomes a mighty army. Not too far from being done here. Numbers 13. That's the story about the spies that go out. So the question might be, as a spy, what do you see? There might be giants in the land. There might be the way you're living right now and your circumstances going on. Like in my 50s, I might have said there were quite a few giants in the land for a bit. But my question to you then is, will you be a worrier, W-O-R-R-I-E-R, or a warrior, W-A-R-R-I-O-R? Because Joshua and Caleb said, God did say that this is ours. And I've seen a bit of evidence. And the grapes are really big. And the women are beautiful. Oh, no, that wasn't it. Sorry. And ten of them went, oh, my God. The giants are so huge. They've got more Facebook friends than us. We can't do it. It says this. Every time you read in the scripture, nevertheless, that's a huge turning point word you need to pay attention to what comes after nevertheless nevertheless the people who dwell in the land are strong the cities are fortified and very large they're looking in that rear view mirror side view mirror moreover we saw the descendants of Anak there the Amalekites Hittites Jebusites Amorites Canaanites along the banks of the Jordan Caleb quieted the people he's getting ready to say God did say and he said let us go up at once a place of faith today, now, let's take possession for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. They gave the children of Israel a bad report. The land through uh, that we have gone through as spies, it devours its inhabitants. That was not a true statement. And all of them are of great stature. We see, saw giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. So we were in their sight. If you're not letting God write on your heart, your size, who you are, you will begin to see. There's only two trees to look at. There's either the tree of life, and he's writing his value in your heart from the tree of life, or you're over here reasoning, did God say, he said, you're either for me or against me. It's an all or nothing deal when it comes to that. It's like, uh, I don't know if this was over here, like the Jones TV network. I think it's on there. The show Kung Fu. It's about 30 years old. David Carradine. He's a wandering guy, but he's a, learning to be a Shaolin priest, and then he's living over in America. But what was his name when he's the little guy? He was Grasshopper. The grasshopper turns in to be the strong and powerful under control Shaolin priest from his training because every day he takes another step in control of himself and toward this thing he wants to be. He always has a remembrance from these flashbacks in the show of grasshopper. His remembrance stones along the way, he remembers what he was, but he now knows what he's trained to be, and they just miss that as the spies. So let me start closing. Wilderness, major questions. They challenge the words of faith that need to come from your mouth. They will challenge the strength of faith in your heart. How you act in your wilderness, how you act when these major questions come, how you respond 
that can define your future vision. A few simple things to remember. The step of risk that we take in faith does not equal mistake or wrong. You know, like when you think you have a giftedness, when you begin to pray in tongues for the first time, and it's just this step into the supernatural that gets awkward and it doesn't go right, that immediately feels like mistake, wrong. I need to shut down. I can't do that again. Totally false. Totally, totally false. Peter denies the Lord three times. What does the Lord come back later and say? Three times. Peter, feed my lambs. Peter, feed my sheep. It's like he's saying, three times you denied me. I'm going to repeal each one of those and let you know you and I are back to ground zero and we're good. We're like this again. He'll do that when you think you make a mistake. Things always come down to finances. I don't have enough money. Okay, that might be true. But you've got to believe that if the Lord's writing a vision on you in your heart, then he will give you provision for the vision. There's provision for the call. There's provision for the vision. Another phrase the Lord gave me is, I don't want to take for granted the things God has granted me to take. I'll say that again. I don't want to take for granted the things that God has granted me to take. I have to be sober-minded. I have to pursue God. I have to stand and watch on the rampart. I can't just hope it'll happen. I need to do my part. Malachi is a good learning for that. Malachi is the last book for 400 years. God is silent. Four chapters, four simple thoughts. The first thing he says in chapter 1 is, you tell me it's such a pain to keep my laws, and it's so exasperating. I need you to fix that. Chapter 2, he says, this relationship between you and me, it's reflected in this relationship right here. How are you doing with your wife? Because the Lord knows there's going to be a bride-bridegroom paradigm in the New Testament. And how that works between Christ and his body is how it works between a man and a woman. And it ultimately starts with how you interact with your father. Chapter 3, real simple. How are you doing with your money? That's bring all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, blah, 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 blah. But in real simple terms, he might have just said, how are you doing stewarding your money? Because it's actually my provision for your vision, and we need to get that right. Chapter 4, the simplicity of, he's talking about Elijah, but he means John the Baptist, and he says, I'm going to send the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. And maybe that's the summary of things of, you've got to get your heart right with me. You've got to get your earthly relationships right. You've got to get your provision right, but the ultimate thing you've got to do is get your heart right with me, your Father. Because if my heart with the Father isn't right, nothing else works. That's the whole reason that the Holy Spirit comes to lead you to Christ, who wants to lead you to the Father. There's no fear of failure when there's a Father in the room. There is no fear of failure when there's a Father in the room. So... I don't want to take things for granted, and maybe an easy lesson for all of us would be go read Malachi and think about those four things and get those right. That means I'm not taking things for granted. Vision and calling is ultimately about relationship. Think about a business. What is the business vision about? It has to be about customers. My number one customer is my Father God. My calling is about my God and my relationship with Him. So. Starting to close here. I said I was closing. Now I'm really closing. I'm leaving my 50s, but here's my hope. 50 is the number for Pentecost. 50 days after resurrection, the Holy Spirit is sent into the world. God's ultimate plan doesn't stop on the cross. Please don't miss that. It stops when he sends the Holy Spirit into the earth. The door gets opened by the cross. It's finished on Pentecost when Peter stands up and says, here's the story, here's the deal. I'm going to believe for that. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is truth. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom or liberty. I'm believing approaching 60, and I want you to believe for yourself that God has the truth you need, even when you can't find it. Those are words to a song. can't remember which one it is. And there's freedom and liberty in him. And guess what the number 50 stood for in the Old Testament? Jubilee, because Jubilee every 50 years was a canceling of the debt, a do-over period, if you want to say it that way, which I don't know that they ever actually did that. I don't know that we ever actually read that they ever did Jubilee like they were supposed to, because it just all unraveled so fast. But I'm believing for Jubilee. I'm believing for freedom, a move of the Spirit, a greater gifting, things that he can write on my heart, and my 60s are going to look a whole lot different than they are in the 50s. 
I might even look a little. Thank you. <laughs> Matthew 16, 16. It all hinges on this. Peter's a good little Jewish boy. He's tried to do some right things with the Lord to get out of the boat, to walk on water. You know, we should give him some credit for that. He is the guy that stands up on the day of Pentecost. He and John somehow are so full of God that their shadow when they're walking to temple heals people. Somewhere in the middle of that, he denies the Lord three times. I think he's the one that cut off the guy's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane. When they do the Feast of the Tabernacles with Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, he wants to be a good little Jewish boy and say, let's make three tabernacles. And Jesus is going, Peter, 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 Peter. For a thousand years, this Jewish system has been going on, and Peter's, you know, trying to stay with it. And then there's this man standing in front of him. That's the embodiment, the personal relationship of everything you could ever hope the Messiah would be. And he's trying so hard, and it's like tradition in this guy, and tradition in this guy, and reasoning. And did God say, well, maybe that's him. God did, no, uh, you know. And the Pharisees, and I could get in trouble, and he was mad at me for this. And one day Jesus says, Peter, who do you say I am? And somehow through all that, he just blurts out, Thou art the Christ, and you are the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, Universal forever Kodak moment. Stop the presses. My whole church is built on the ability for every man and every woman for all eternity, backwards and forwards, to recognize me as Lord and Savior. Everybody has to answer that major question. And if there's any first thing you need to say in the middle of being distressed, discontented, in debt, charred, burned, and you just need to start with, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I can't tell you any better place to start than that statement right there. Two last things. Don't worry about your family line and your upbringing. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Genesis 38, this Judah guy, he's got three sons. One of the sons marries a woman, Tamar. The first two sons are so wicked, God kills them, and that's Tamar's, one is Tamar's husband. So there's a third son, and he's a bit young yet, but you were supposed to, when there was a widow of a son, give them to another son so that she was not left uncovered and childless. But uh, uh, Judah forgets to do that. So it's years down the road, and she's still uncovered and childless, and she reasons out, I'm going to get to Judah. So she dresses up like a prostitute, and he, you know, great man of God he's supposed to be, he does it with the prostitute and finds out later he's tricked, and it's his daughter-in-law. And then she has twins, and the first twin comes out, and when the first one comes out, they tie a red string around the hand because the first son gets twice the inheritance everybody else does. But the hand goes back in. And a second hand comes out. And so the second baby, the latter rain baby, is born before the former rain baby. And they go, how did you break through? And they name the child Perez. And I might not quite get this right, but guess what? Perez ends up uh, having, um, who's Ruth's husband? Boaz, thank you. Oh, you guys are so smart. You should go to Bible college. It goes to Boaz, it goes to David, it goes to Jesus Christ. So somewhere Jesus Christ can go. This lion of the tribe of Judah guy, he was distressed and discontent and in debt for a little bit and probably pretty charred for a while. That's my family lineage, but that's where I come from because God said so. The other thing I would say is this, 1 Kings 18, Elijah says it's not going to rain for three and a half years. And it doesn't. And then he decides it's going to rain. He tells his servant, go out and look. Tell me when the rain clouds are coming. And six times the servant goes out, Ahab, I think is his name. And he just says, dude, <laughs> there is not a cloud in sight. Okay, one more time. Seventh time, like the walls of Jericho. Go look. It's so far away that he's going like, eh, it looks like about the size of my hand, about, you know, a zillion kilometers away. What does Elijah say? You better hook up the chariot and the horse and get going because it's going to rain buckets. So this is what I want to say to you. It's a little bit where I feel right now. If all I can see is a little cloud the size of a man's hand as far as the vision the Lord's written on my heart, start with that. And that vision's going to rain buckets in your life. Acts 4.13, they marveled at untrained and uneducated men. 
but they had been with Jesus. And they said, oh, my God, how bold these guys are because they went and actually were with that guy. If you need vision, go be with the guy. Hide him in your heart. Let him dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Last thing, the word distinction has been bothering me. As of August 11th, I've been saved for 49 years. And I feel like everybody else. And somehow when I read the New Testament in the book of Acts, they weren't like everybody else. I don't feel much distinction. And I ran across the word distinct in 1 Corinthians 14. It's talking about confusion in the church, like tongues and interpretation and stuff flying all over, and there was no order in the place, and nobody knew what was going on, and people were coming in and going, what's all this foreign language stuff? And it says in the middle there's something like, you can have a bunch of instruments playing, but unless they're all doing the same thing, it's not distinct. It's a bunch of noise. And you can hear that. You go into a symphony, and when they're tuning up, they're, you know, and some guy's doing, you know, with percussion, and somebody else, and it's really disjointed. Then, and all of a sudden, one man, one woman, walks up and goes, and then starts making a bunch of hand movements like Rascal Three, Omaha, and all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, all this beautiful music comes out. Jesus Christ must be that man to walk up, to orchestrate all of our, what's it called, clanging cymbals and something like that that's in the, somewhere in the scripture. We need to let him do that. I thought about if it was Christmas time, we could just burst out in song, but you would have this symphony that was just making a lot of noise, and all of a sudden it's Handel's Messiah going, and all of a sudden we're all going, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever and ever, and the women sopranos go, hallelujah, hallelujah, for the Lord, and we're, oh, that is so cool. But that all started a mess till somebody walks to the front and goes, okay, here we go. What you would perceive to be distressed and discontented and in debt and charred musicians, all of a sudden we're all on it together. And God sent his Holy Spirit to write vision on your heart and my heart and to help us have rattling bones become a live body and an army for God. Amen. Um.